Hey everyone, today's guest is the founder of M2 Performance Nutrition. He is the nutrition coach for more than 40 CrossFit Games athletes. He has a PhD from Dartmouth College, and he's also the Power Monkey Camp nutrition expert, the one and only Mike Malloy. Uh, Mike is one of the most knowledgeable and caring coaches I've ever met. We go into some really interesting topics on the nutrition side of things, and I think you guys are going to love this podcast. Let's get into it. So, Mike, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing well, Dave. Thanks for asking. Uh, life is pretty good these days. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. It's good to have you on. Uh, we were going yeah, through the uh, credential list, you know, the things that you kind of put down here, notable facts about yourself, and one kind of jumped out sure. at me. I want to kind of bring it up right away and uh, probably has nothing to do with your industry, but it says you are an incredible <laughs> Top Gun fan. Is that true? <laughs> you, oh, absolutely. I was introduced to Top Gun when I was very young. You know, I was born in 1981, and so like the the height of the 80s and Dolby Surround, you know, sound came out, and uh, my dad got big into that movie, and so I think I've watched that movie in excess of a hundred times. So, well, I think we're just going to make a nice. podcast about Top Gun now because <laughs> if you're aware, if you're that big of a fan, you know, Top Gun Two or Maverick, Top Gun Maverick is coming up pretty soon. Did you see the preview for that thing? Oh, I've seen the previews for it. Yeah, we're like me and my cousin. We're gonna like rent out a theater and everything else. Come like <laughs> debate debut time. It's gonna be it's gonna be a whole thing. Got my flight suit ready. I'm good to go. Nice. I watched the preview. Nice. And I, and I... Go ahead, What's that? I was gonna say I, I believe that Mike probably does have a flight suit. I, I believe that of you. I think you got. I think you got to not... be Maverick at our Power Monkey Camp party next next camp in the spring. You have oh, to yeah. show up as Maverick <laughs> on that Friday night. It's pretty easy. You just wear some aviators and like <laughs> flex your jaw excessively every time you think about anything, and then you can imitate Maverick from Top Gun. You're good to go. <laughs> I watched that preview and I was like, "This is the exact movie, just yeah. 30 years later." And I was hey. like, I looked at it. And I was like, "Yeah, I'm going. I'm going. Absolutely. Yeah, of course, 100 <laughs> percent." So yes, I'm glad we're on the same page with our movie, our movie choices. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely going, but I'm just, I'm a little bit scared too because I don't want to be disappointed. I don't want it to taint the first one. Oh, I know. Uh, any at all for me? But, I hear um, you. You know, yeah, Mike. Though, though, I think you would have been a great Top Gun. I really do. I think you've got the, <laughs> uh, the smarts and and even the look for it for sure. You you fell into nutrition and you know, kind of getting right into the, uh, the questions. And although it's very hard to follow up a Top Gun question, we'll get into it anyway. But uh, you're, you're a nutritionist and, you know, I, I love to look at, um, the guests that are coming on. I love to look at, uh, their websites and really see, see what sticks out mm -hmm. and what is really at the forefront of your website or those websites. And for years, it states specifically a personalized approach to nutrition coaching. So I want to ask you some questions on that. Sure. Uh, but another thing that really stuck out to me is it specifically says that you want to help people perform at home perform at work, perform in the gym, yeah. and perform in life. And so I think when people see M2 performance, right. it um, really can indicate to them that it's about them uh, performing physically like in CrossFit or, or weightlifting or whatever other sport that they're trying to do. But you're stating that you want to help them in other areas. And so those performing at home and work and, and those other ones that I named off I wondered if those are in any certain order of priority for you uh, from your perspective. It's a great question. Yeah. So, you know, my, my work really got started in helping athletes. And so, you know, the title M2 Performance Nutrition was an easy one to kind of come by. But over time, you know, as people have kind of found us from different avenues or as athletes have moved into different parts of their life, you know, we've diversified and at the end of the day, all nutrition comes down to basically helping people align their action with their goals. And so, you know, as uh, somebody comes and says, hey, you know, um, I'm not a top athlete, but I still, you know, looking for help. It's like, yeah, of course we can help you. And so, you know, whether that's with, let's say something like um, finding more energy to be a better mom or dad. Or sometimes it's aligning their health so that they actually have a chance of getting you know, pregnant more easily or something like that. All of those things kind of are encapsulated within the approaches that we do, the approaches that we try to take. And so um, it's hard for me to say what's a top priority, but I would say, you know, mm -hmm. helping people align their actions with their goals is sort of the end game um, 
thing that we try to provide people. And the ultimate goal is tr sort of to probably just create intrinsic happiness, right? Like at mm -hmm. the end of the day, if I can make somebody happy by, you know, having a better relationship with food or making them feel a little bit more comfortable when they're, you know, in gym clothes or by going to the CrossFit games, you know, then that's, that's a win in my book. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I love that, uh, that, uh, kind of priority that, that you laid out there for us. And interesting statistic to me was you, you mentioned that 70% of your clients are actually just looking to get healthy, not necessarily, um, uh, in CrossFit or maybe they're in CrossFit too, but certainly not necessarily right. looking to go to the CrossFit games as you mentioned. Right. And that's the thing is it, probably around about the percentage of CrossFit athletes that are in CrossFit. Uh, probably the percentage is higher than that actually that are just in CrossFit to be uh, healthier. And of course, a big, big part of that is nutrition as well. And right. um, so personalized, I wonder if you can define what personalized mean and personalized means to you when you state that on your website. And, and one of the things that, you know, is easy and easy to say that you personalize for is that CrossFit games level athlete that wants to compete to the best of their ability. Right. Um, so it's easy to kind of say, okay, these are the things that you need to do. This is the time that you need to eat and stuff like that. Um, and I think that you mentioned, you told us a story, or I want you to tell us a story. I haven't heard the story yet of, of a time that really, um, it, it was a learning um, opportunity for you when you realize that CrossFit need, CrossFitters need to be fueled by more carbs. Sure. Can you tell us that story about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So really quick, what does personalized nutrition mean to me? You know, I think everybody is a little bit unique. We're all kind of snowflakes, um, as I like to say. And so at the end of the day, you might have two, you know, uh, 145 pound, you know, five foot four females that exercise for an hour a day in the gym. And it's, if you plug that into an app or an online calculator, they might throw out the same sort of nutritional approach. But let's say one of those people is coming from, you know, a place where they've been, you know, massively under eating, maybe undergoing some binge guilt or restriction cycles. Um, and the other person is coming from a place where they've never actually paid attention to nutrition in their life. And so how do you, how do you go about, you know, generating results in those people is actually a totally different approach. For one, you've got to sort of, restore perhaps some, some metabolic health some physical health, um, and get them to a place where they, you know, are breaking the cycle of, um, you know, feeling really guilty about decisions that they're making on weekends and then, you know, massively slashing their food intake during the weekdays. And the other person, it's just more so about education about, Hey, what is a macronutrient? You know, how much protein should I put on a plate? Um, and things like that. So that's kind of what personalized nutrition means to me. Now, when it when you kind of apply that in general to the CrossFit community, um, and maybe even broader to sort of the more active fitness community overall, you know, I entered the nutrition scene when there was sort of a little bit of a fear around carbohydrates. Paleo was really at its sort of its height, and that's not necessarily a low carb approach, but a lot of people sort of have interpreted it that way. And you know, I think I think if you look at CrossFit twelve years ago, you know, Monday might have been five by five back squat. Tuesday was maybe a 20 minute workout like Cindy or something like that. Maybe Wednesday was, you know, row 5k. And now, you know, Monday might be five by five back squat, followed by a 20 minute AMRAP. Let's do some accessory work and then we'll call it quits and get home. And so, you know, the, the world has changed. The programming has changed even for your sort of baseline, you know, 70% client. And in that situation, you know, it was my opinion going through the literature and reading about as close as I could find to studies that kind of looked at high intensity training, that people would be, you know, one, better fueled for their performance with increased carbohydrate intake, and then two, their bodies would recover better, maybe handle the stress response of that training better uh, in a carbohydrate rich environment. And so I'm not the only one by any stretch of the imagination, you know, with this sort of uh, messenger agenda, but, you know, putting this out there and, you know, like mid, you know, the mid 2010, so 2015 was definitely sort of a different concept at the time. And what was the response like? I mean, if you're in there <laughs> coaching these athletes and recommending these things that are looked at as yeah. maybe different than what's already out there, what was the response initially? And has that changed over the course of the past five years or so? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, um, my first elite athlete, just to kind of give a perspective, was to uh, Teja Persevich, you know, CrossFit Mayhem now, um, relatively household name within the CrossFit community. And Tasia came to me from uh, a gymnastics background, a lot of 
issues around food um, due to some poor nutritional coaching earlier in her life. And um, she's talked about those publicly and stuff. So that that's all out there. Um, and so I said, you know, we're going to, we're going to rank her carbohydrate up, you know, intake up quite a bit here. We're going to do it slowly over time. And we're going to work on this together. And I definitely felt like there was a sense of fear um, in her mind, like, Oh my God, I'm going to blow up. I'm going to get fat. Carbs are bad for me. Um, and the best way to make it past that is showing them one that they feel great two that performance is just like next level. Um, and then three, you know, gaining that trust that you're willing to listen, you're willing to adjust as they go through moments when, you know, things aren't feeling great. Um, and so that's exactly what happened with Tasia. You know, we worked up slowly. I think she, you know, podiumed at like three of the major competitions that year, including Guadalupe, Granite Games and East Coast Classic, which was another big comp back then. And so that really helped. But like, you know, if, if Tasia was on this right now with us, she'd say, oh, my God, I still have moments of weakness. I still have moments where I feel like I'm eating too much, even though I know in my heart that I'm not. Um, now, has that changed a little bit? Yeah. You know, I think athletes are are getting the message that they need to fuel their bodies. Um, and so that's probably no like nowhere more prevalent than in the younger teenage athletes. So, you know, they come in and I ask them to eat, you know, 350, 400 grams of carbohydrates and they don't blink. You know, they say, is this going to make me perform better? And I say, yep. And they say, okay, let's do it, you know? And so um, I don't know if it's just because they're younger and they haven't been brainwashed by society as much, but, the, you know, there's definitely still, there's definitely still issues that we have to work through, but it's getting better and it's changing every day. So just on the topic of carbs real quickly, I mean, not all carbs are created equal, right? I mean, if you're recommending an intake of increased carbs, it doesn't mean like, all right, sweet, let's go and get that Wonder Bread and just, you know, pack it on. <laughs> Uh, you right. know what I mean? Like, I think being a little more specific as to what those carbs can and should right. look like, uh, can you right. give a, some examples if you're recommending carbs to these athletes and saying, okay, you should be increasing by this much, what would you normally recommend in terms of what those carbs should look like? Right. So it's a great, it's a great comment and a great question, Dave. So I think at the end of the day, you know, if you've got somebody that's training, you know, three, four, maybe five days a week for 45 minutes to an hour a day. Most of their carbohydrates should come from all natural sources, fruits, veggies, potatoes, squashes, things like that. When you start to ramp up your training and your intensity, there's going to come a point where you, you just can't eat another freaking potato. Like you're like, I'm done with these things. I want no more, but I still need to get some carbs in. What do I do? And so in that situation, we're going to recommend denser carbohydrate sources, but with some caveats. So our typical go-to ones are things like white rice, oatmeal, um, as sort of the, the staples for people. Why? They tend to be very low inflammatory. So they're not going to cause any, you know, gastrointestinal distress in most people. Um, secondarily, like I was just saying, they're, they're denser and they're easier to get down into the body. And so essentially, at the end of the day, what you can think about is sort of you, it's not an and or question. It's not a quantity or quality question. If you're an elite athlete, you need to have quality, you know, carbohydrates in your diet, again, fruits, veggies, um, squashes, uh, sweet potatoes, things like that. And you need to have enough dense carbohydrate in addition to that, such that you're not spending literally every minute of every day, either chewing or digesting food, which isn't going to go very well in your training sessions. So that's sort of, you know, for an elite athlete, how we would adapt and say, you know, eat more carbs. Yeah. It's not gummy bears and, you know, Coke and, or soda, maybe I should say, um, it's, smart approaches, you know, timed around their workouts using specific foods in addition to intake of high quality carbohydrates. So with the people that you're working with, Mike, do you get um, some favorite misconceptions? I know I have some of my own and just going through my <laughs> own life and, and figuring out what works and wasn't work for my own self. Do you get misconceptions as to what, you know, nutrition is all about from people, you know, examples of like bro science, things like that, that people claim to work, <laughs> but have no actual... Uh, science oh, behind it? A hundred percent. Probably the most prevalent one. And th this is not to make fun of people. This is literally, if you're out there and you're reading, you know, magazines and stuff, you're like, I should eat five meals a day, right? It's going to stoke my metabolic fire. And sadly, no evidence that meal frequency, having six meals, 12 meals, 14 meals a day does anything beneficial for your metabolism over time. Um, so that's a really great one that's actually been disproven, disproven recently, getting away from these bro science ideas. 
Um, that, that one particularly, Mike, can we just touch on that one a little bit more? Yeah. Because that seems <laughs> completely mm-hmm. contrary to what is prevalent now in terms of eating regime throughout the day, which is fasting. This idea of, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, eating within a window instead of eating, you know, smaller meals throughout the entire day, which was, you know, taken as, you know, the, the end all be all when it comes to meal planning. Now it's OK, let's fast right. 16, 16 hours, eat within our eight hour window or whatever it might be your window. That's right. completely changed. And now fasting has become kind of the, the thought process behind when uh, you should be planning right. out your meals. So there's two different like sort of end goals there. So like this idea that was disproven around, you know, having five to six meals a day was, you know, you're constantly, you know, kind of keeping your metabolic, um, you know, biology operating and going at a high level by having your digestive system going. This increases what's called the thermic effect of food and all this other sun, you know, stuff. And so that was their goal. So it didn't work, but let's just say that was their purpose. The purpose behind intermittent fasting, people kind of lose sight of this, I think. Intermittent fasting is designed from a health point of view, right? So the thought process is that if you go a certain amount of time without eating, your body is forced into this, um, this state called autophagy, where it's basically autophagy means self-eating, auto, self, phage, eat. And so in that situation, the cells, because they don't have any fuel coming in, start to break down like old protein and use them as uh, energy sources. And so this is thought to sort of be like a house cleaning within your cells. And so you can, you know, apply this approach and say, uh, if I can induce autophagy, I will have better metabolic health within my cells. And this will ultimately lead to a healthier, you know, full organism overall. And so they were actually, you know, two completely different sort of end goals that kind of had conflicting, you know, um, conflicting uh, purposes to them at the end, at the start. So did I, did I get at that question, Dave, a little bit? Yeah. And, and your recommendation, I mean, I've been doing intermittent fasting for a while now and and I I have found it to be very helpful for myself. Um, I'm just curious mm-hmm. what your thoughts are on it in terms of general population versus potentially applying it to like right. a competitor. So um, let's say general population. So in general, intermittent fasting for weight loss is no better or worse than any other type of diet out there as long as calories are kept equal. Why it works is essentially you're cutting your eating window in half in a day, right? So 24 hours in a day, you're going to sleep roughly eight of those, I hope. Um, and so you've got 16 hours left. Typically, a, a fasting window is about eight hours, 16 hours. So you have eight hours to eat. You know, it's hard to get down as much food in eight hours as you can in 16 hours. And so you generally will tend to eat less food. And this is what ultimately leads to people losing weight. Um, so at the end of the day, a perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable protocol for weight loss in general population. For health, I think there's some really, really interesting studies. So most of them come from rodent work uh, and sort of even simpler genetic species where they put animals on sort of these fasted protocols. They have longer lifespans. Um, they have better immune health, better metabolic health, uh, better control of diabetes and things of that nature. So far, that has yet to really be replicated in humans simply because it takes time. Um, we don't know the answers to those yet. I will say that there's some really educated people in that fasting field that say, the eight-hour window in a human, or excuse me, the sixteen-hour window in a human isn't long enough to induce some of those same effects that are taking, you know, taking hold in a rodent because a, a mouse's metabolism just works so much faster than a, than a human's. So, you know, I know people that will do two, three, four-day fasts a couple of times a year to induce this state um, and go from there. Now, from a point of view of sort of an athletic population intermittent fasting some people love it you know i I talked with a relatively elite male crossfitter he said i've been doing intermittent fasting it's been great i said cool you know tell me more about it he says well i'm actually eating more in this window because it reminds me that i have to actually go eat and so i'm really conscientious about it and i said well that's that's awesome it's working for you crush it but i think in general for people that are training you know four four or five hours a day it can be a little bit tricky um because there's a huge stress response associated with that training volume, especially within the, you know, the world of functional fitness, CrossFit and things of that nature. And so, you know, at M2 in in general, my thought process is, you know, you want to have uh, a post-workout fuel or meal that's designed to restore muscle glycogen for one and two, blunt or stop the stress response, which is a a hormone called cortisol um, that's specifically affected by blood glucose levels. And so if you finish training and then you can't eat for three more hours, you're potentially compromising your recovery for your additional training session later that afternoon 
or potentially even the next day. And so it can work for some athletes. There are some athletes out there that absolutely love it, but in general, it's not a go-to place for us. We're going to be more focused on meal timing around, around training windows, as opposed to trying to optimize our health through an intermittent fasting approach. Yeah, I think a lot of us at Power Monkey have been uh, doing the intermittent fasting for a while. I think I've been doing it for about five years now. I, I overheard your lecture at, at the last camp, and mm -hmm. you guys know how camp is. It's crazy. We don't get to <laughs> really listen to each other as much as, as much as we'd like. But I heard you mention something about, and, and you laid it out here, the, the common um, fasting period is 16 hours. Um, I thought you had mentioned something about 12 hours and some sort of research in, in that regard. Can you elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? For sure. So diving into this window or this idea that fasting in humans takes longer than 16 hours, there's this sort of new field of research or new new terminology called time restricted eating. And so the thought process is that you have sort of a natural, you know, uh, rhythm to the genetic expression of a lot of proteins in your body um, that kind of correlates to 24 hours. And so the thought process is that if you can time your eating into a certain window, there's uh, metabolic advantages that will prevent you from moving into a, a, a disease state. And so, again, this was done most uh, effectively in a rodent population, a really, really nicely done one, but they basically put these mice on a really high fat, high carb diet designed to get them obese, but they restricted their time eating into a specific window, uh, in this case overnight because mice are nocturnal. Um, and what they showed was that there was um, a significant, you know, sort of benefit for the metabolic health, for the weight gain of these mice. And then oddly enough, they actually ended up doing significantly better on um, basically sort of like a cardio test, for lack of a better word. They put them on a, on a wheel and they just ran them until they couldn't run anymore. And the mice that were on this time-restricted eating window um, did significantly better. And so how long can that window be? Anywhere from 9 to 12 hours was effective. Once they went uh, beyond 12 hours, that they lost that effect. And what, what the other thing that was really cool was that they showed that if they did this only five days a week, and then on two days, they let them kind of eat freely for those two days, they still maintain that beneficial effect. And so there's some really, really smart people out there that saying, yeah, you know, fasting is one thing that you may have to go way longer than 16 hours to get the beneficial health um, aspects from, but you can employ this time restricted eating of somewhere between nine to 12 hours, get a real, a lot of additional really nice health benefits too, as well. Um, both performance and health wise. Yeah, that that's very cool. I think my my window of eating is probably closer to nine or ten hours, uh, cheating away from that that normal <laughs> normal eight and sixteen anyway. So that that's good. That's good to hear for sure. And you know, especially being on this topic, it is a, a hot topic that we wanted to talk about. What is your end recommendation uh, for for people that want to try this that, that or that for people that are already doing it? Is it eight and sixteen or or is it something like? Uh, that nine to 12 window? I typically start with nine to 12 um, and just go from there and sort of see how people do and see how people feel with it. Some people love it, you know, and I typically find that the more sort of uh, controlled the rest of their life is, the better they're going to respond to it. So um, for somebody to want to experiment with intermittent fasting, I want to see that they have a good understanding of their dietary intake first off. So they're not trying to live in a calorie deficit. Uh, they don't have binge restrict, you know, cycles to their diet. I want to make sure that they're sleeping really well. Um, I want to make sure that their training is appropriate volume. Um, and I want to make sure that their stretch management systems are, are solid and that they're in a good place. Because essentially, in my mind, if those four things aren't being taken care of first, you've got much bigger sort of pieces of the nutritional or health pie that you could put your energy into and have bigger impacts on your life. But once you have that, you know, sort of taken care of and you want to try intermittent fasting, yeah, I would say start with 12 hours, which is really quite, you know, relatively straightforward. Uh, it could be six to six and then start to back it off to maybe 10 hours and then nine hours. And then ultimately, you know, for a true, you know, typical sort of online intermittent fasting protocol, getting it down to eight hours and seeing how you feel, how you respond. Um, and then ultimately you should probably take some time and say, okay, this looks great. This is, this is working for me if it is. You know, is this just because I, I've decided that I like intermittent fasting and it's the cool new thing to do and I've got a placebo effect going on? Or, you know, if I come out of this, do I actually notice a physical difference? Do I, do I start to perform worse? Do I have worse sleep, um, you know, worse mood, things like that? So, Do you have a, um, 
a particular diet regimen that you've kind of settled on for yourself? Do you use any of these fasting techniques? Um, anything that you find to be helpful for your own personal goals and training right now? <laughs> yeah. So for me, I did try intermittent fasting for a while. Um, I just really love breakfast like a lot and I like to eat relatively quickly upon waking up. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a great approach for a lot of people. It did not end up working for me. I felt no significant benefit from it. So for my own personal dietary intake, um, my general thought process is relatively straightforward. So even though our, our company is based from macro tracking, I only track my macros once a week to kind of set my calibration of like, okay, do I still actually know what four ounces of chicken looks like? Typically, no. Typically, I start to think things are bigger <laughs> than they should be. Mm. Um, but yeah, I generally try to follow approach of relatively balanced protein, fat, and carb intake across uh, three meals. And then I really hammer myself hard on post-workout nutrition. So, you know, at this point, you know, my training exists, or per, you know, primarily around a CrossFit session and then some rock climbing on the side of that. And so I found that if I don't really take care of having um, fast digesting carbohydrates immediately after my training, followed by a solid meal about an hour after that, then the rest of my day, like I'm a zombie, I'm useless. And so for me to, you know, to have the health that I want, the body composition that I want to eat the volume of food that I enjoy, uh, and still be functional. I found that, you know, three solid meals, a snack, and then really, really paying attention to post-workout nutrition is what I need to do. But yeah, I'm, nothing, I'm, nothing trendy or fancy like intermittent fasting. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I'm just curious with regards to, because I found the same thing, you know, I've had to test plenty of different types of diets and things like that and, and different, you know, what's in, in at the moment uh, and seeing mm -hmm. what works best for me. But something like intermittent fasting or whatever else, how long of a, a period would you recommend someone testing something to see the benefits before they're like moving on to something else or saying this either works or doesn't work? Does it take a week? Yeah. Does it take a month? Like how long should you test something before you actually are expected to see the benefits? Right. So let's, let's kind of break that down into two different areas. So from a lifestyle point of view, you're going to know pretty quickly if intermittent fasting or keto or any of these other things are good or bad for you. Like if you find that you just forget to eat or it's not working with your lifestyle, then like I would honestly bail pretty early on because you know, creating more stress from your diet is the exact opposite from what thing that you want to be doing. But from a biological point of view, typically what we want to see is somewhere between two to four weeks of really strict adherence to something before we start to make um, adjustments to that protocol. And so the reason for that is it just seems to take that amount of time for your body to adapt um, to a lot of these different situations. So let's say that you decide um, that, you know, you're coming from a paleo background and you decide, you know, where you're a low carb background, maybe is a better way to say it, and that you're going to all of a sudden try to eat a more balanced approach of food. Um, and this causes you to increase your carbohydrate intake, all, you know, healthy plant-based, you know, uh, you know, potatoes, vegetables, sweet potatoes. You decide to bring those back into your diet. The first week actually is probably going to feel not so good. And the reason for that is that if you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates in this instance, your body downregulates the production of these things called amylase, which are enzymes that break down carbohydrates. The thought process is I'm not eating them, so why should I make them? But now you've reintroduced them into your body. And it takes somewhere between 7 to 14 days for your body to ramp up the production of those to where it should be. And so if you decide in the first two weeks this feels like crap, then you're probably not giving enough of a chance. And so from week two to four, then you start to actually be able to say, okay, I've adapted to this. How am I feeling? You know, um, am I treating this the right way? Have I decided to incorporate carbs in the sense that I'm going to stick to whole foods or have I now mentally, you know, checked off that list and I've started to, you know, move into the lucky charms aisle and, you know, because I feel like this, this freedom to eat whatever quote carbs I want. Um, and all of that has to be taken into consideration when figuring out if the nutrition plan is working for you. You know, there's the hardcore biology and the science side of it, which with my background, I absolutely love. But I think so many nutrition coaches out there lose sight of like what is realistically going to work for a person's personality type, for their social structure in their life, their family life. Um, that can be hard, right? And so um, all, all that needs to be taken into account. And I don't think you can get a real answer in less than 30 days. Fantastic. It's good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, kind of changing the topic a, a little bit here, 
Let's uh, let's drop a, uh, just a, a really big bomb. Have you seen the movie The Game Changers? <laughs> yeah, I have. <laughs> I have. And, and you know, I'm going to ask, what is your, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, we could talk about this probably for a couple hours. I'm oh, sure, for sure. Uh, being with you. So what what is kind of your quick uh, take on that message? So uh, can you be an elite athlete and be vegan? Absolutely. I think the movie tries to show that to the nth degree. Um, you know, we work with a lot of elite vegan athletes. I work with uh, Sarah Sigma's daughter. She's fully vegan uh, from an ethical point of view, you know. And so the real question isn't, can you be an elite athlete and be vegan? The appropriate question from that movie is, is being a vegan better for you if you want to be an elite athlete? And at the end of the day, the science really doesn't back up a lot of the statements that are in that movie. Um, like any production, there's an agenda behind it. Um, I think it's really interesting for people to note that James Cameron made that movie and he is a major, major investor in a vegan food company. Um, and so there are some conflict of interests there that, you know, they don't talk about while hammering on sort of the traditional food pyramid industry. Um, we could go down a, a, a large rabbit hole on this conversation. Um, but to say that the movie is biased is probably being a bit kind. Um, there's been some really great breakdowns of it and I could point people in directions. We can put them in show notes and things like that if they want to read it. But I think at the end of the day, um, there, the two take home messages for me was sort of like, yes, you can be an elite athlete and be vegan. I don't think that was controversial. Um, and that two, you know, these, the message that they put out there was protein, protein, protein. You don't actually need protein to be, you know, or to perform an elite level. I also agree with, and that they say, you know, increase your carbohydrate intake if you're training a bunch. And I also agree with that. I think it's just sort of this all or nothing approach of saying that meat is going to cause you to be a worse athlete is where they kind of lose me. And I think a lot of the scientific community, um, if they had stopped and said, you know, you should increase your intake of, you know, vegetables and fruits and fed in uh, potatoes and things like that to a significant amount. And you don't need to eat nearly as much protein. I think that wouldn't have been controversial at all. And I think it would have been a really great message. But of course, it makes for a shitty movie if they do that. And so they wouldn't, it yeah, wouldn't have been on Netflix. Some of it is being controversial, right? It, some of it is right. getting every single person to talk about it on their podcasts and on, you know, in yeah. newspapers. It's, mm -hmm. That's part of kind of what they're probably trying to get across. It's why it's been in the media so so much lately. Um, right. I, 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 find, I found it to be rather interesting and, and obviously inflammatory in a lot of ways and just trying to get people to... <laughs> get a uh, uh you know riled up on certain topics um yeah you know and it's also just a really well-made movie right oh like, yeah like it's visually Absolutely. very pleasing if you watch that you're like you're like holy shit like i want to be a vegan this looks yeah. awesome mm -hmm. well you i mean, I mean a lot of people just... who are vegan too eat like shit i mean just because you're <laughs> vegan doesn't mean that you live a healthy lifestyle i mean vegan can be a terrible diet i mean so it really i think that's a great do... point like Go one ahead, one one really good example on that, Dave, is the the um the plant burgers, right? The impossible burgers and things like that. Right. Like they're actually terrible for you. <laughs> like right. they're the ingredient list in there is it's like a reading a, a chemical book, you know. Um and at the end of the day, like they're you know, they're being put out there, it's like, oh, it's vegan, it's good for you. And man, it's not like it's really not. But, you know, if you just take a all or nothing sort of simplistic view on it, you're like, OK, well, it's vegan. I'm going to eat it. It's good for me. And I think that's kind of the point you were getting at. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can equate vegan with being healthy. That That's just not the right. case. And I think right. and I don't eat meat. I eat fish, but I haven't eaten meat for six, seven years. And uh, some of right. it has to do with just household. My wife doesn't eat meat. And so it's just been mm -hmm. a lifestyle change that we've kind of incorporated. But, you know, I can appreciate the fact that quality of food if someone's going and hunting their food and eating meat at a very high quality that's going to be right. substantially more beneficial than someone saying they're eating a vegan diet that's made up of oreos and you know whatever else that that's completely processed so to me it's quality right. of food it's you know eating what a lot of people say which i think you can probably agree upon this idea of eating a predominantly plant-based diet which does not mean that mm -hmm. it needs to be completely vegan right. and you can kind of parse in these other things but i think you kind right. of get lost in this, this idea that vegan means healthy and i think that's that's just not the case i yeah you're 100 percent right and you know i think at the end of the day if anybody wants to make the choice to go down a vegan or vegetarian path or whatever pescatarian path if it's for ethical reasons like that 
that's not my place to debate. That's not like, that's your personal opinion. And like, that's a totally different ball game. But if you want to argue what's the best, you know, approach for my health, longevity and or human performance, well, then we actually have to use data, right? We can't just talk about, well, you know, case studies of, hey, I did this and I felt a lot better. It's like, well, if you went from eating a relatively crappy diet to incorporating a ton of vegetables and fruits into your body, well, no shit, right? Like, of course you felt better. Um, conversely, if you go from eating a relatively good diet and now you're hunting to try to find something to get protein in and you're just slamming down protein shakes all day, well, did you really make a smart educational change for your health and performance there? And my answer would probably be no. Um, and so those are two different topics, I think, in my mind. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I'm a little disappointed in Dave that he's talking bad about Oreos. I think we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna lose a lot of listeners uh, due to that comment there, Dave. We may have to edit that out. Um, I did have a exactly. pop chart yesterday. I have to I have to admit, oh, my wow. wife is pregnant right now, and there are pop tarts <laughs> in the house, and I had one, so I, I wouldn't mind an Oreo sure. here and then as well. Uh, that's going to be a new a new nightly meal for you, Dave. A, a good pop tart. Pop tarts are delicious, that's for sure. But Mike, let's go to the the complete other side of that, the carnivore side, just just oh, briefly yeah. here. Again, we can dig into this forever as well. But for those uh, athletes, and really, I think there are a lot of athletes and a lot of um, just individuals in general that are seeing results and getting healthier from going to the extreme of carnivore and maybe you know you never know if those individuals are really holding to that 100 percent or not right but do you think it's the actual carnivore diet that's doing that or kind of like what we were saying um with the vegan it, it's it's uh, the ones that are really in it and are, are committed to it they're just uh eating or making better choices do you think that's a part of it or is it the actual diet no i think it's they're they're making better choices and probably the removing something from their diet that was pissing their body off in the first place right and so you know, if they removed a ton of processed grains from their diet, we'll say as an example, by going to the carnivore diet, and now all of a sudden they feel a thousand times better. Well, is it because they're eating substantially more meat or is it because they removed, you know, something that their body wasn't agreeing with in the first place? My gut reaction is that it would probably be the latter. Um, you know, we've done a lot of studies in the world of nutrition to figure out how much protein we really need. And from a health point of view, from an athletic point of view, um, you know, the answer tends to be, not tends to be, it's pretty much like, I hate to use the word proven, but supports the idea of about 1.8 grams per kilo of body weight, right? And so if you're a, let's just say 100 kilo male, that's 180 grams. Doesn't mean you can't eat more than that, but that's all you need. Anything beyond that is sort of like, it's fine. It's good. It's, it's neither good nor bad for your body, but there's no there's no benefit to going beyond it. And so for somebody to all of a sudden say that they feel significantly better on a carnivore diet, my, my gut reaction is it's probably due to something that they're no longer eating more than the fact that they're only exclusively eating like a carnivore would. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, uh, something like uh, carnivore and actually did carnivore, meaning carnivore or uh, mostly just red meat, cheese and eggs. And also one or two beers every night. That was my my version of of, of carnivore. The drunk, the drunk and, carnivore is what I heard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, but for me, the reason why I like that is because I love to eat meat. It's easy to do that, and it's and it's easy to. Um, it makes my decision making a lot simpler. I don't mm -hmm. have to. Um, if if we're gonna go out and eat fast food or or something like that, or at a restaurant, I don't have to worry about anything. Uh, the decision making process of it because right. I know that I'm going to I'm sticking to this specific meal plan right now. And so I think that's another thing that benefits um, uh, people in regards to being on specific diets and, and everything else. But right. talking about that beer, that beer that, that I have, and, and I do have one or two beers usually uh, almost every night. Sure. Um, I, I've always appreciated, Mike, your support on that and, and what i mean by that is that you know you you put out a, a post i think it was a uh, new year's eve saying hey look you guys are gonna go drink and have a good time so please do that but understand there's some uh yeah. some science behind it so you called it right. science-based boozing can you elaborate <laughs> on that a little bit as well yeah for sure so um i just think it's so unrealistic to think that people are not going to go out and be social and that they're going to live like you know monks and only eat either a vegan diet or a carnivore diet or a paleo diet like they're going to do things that are you know uh, against that 
And it's all about finding the right balance. You know, operating at extremes is a recipe for disaster. And so I'd rather give people the tools to go out and have a good time without it massively impacting their lives for, you know, 48 hour hangovers. And so the, 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 the short story behind this is that this group uh, took a bunch of uh, volunteers and they gave them different diets before they got them wasted. And at the end of the day, they said the next day, how do you feel? Um, and they did a couple of other analyses. And it's the, the best way to kind of handle your body's breakdown of alcohol turns out to be a high protein, high fiber diet before you go drinking. So uh, basically what you need to do is combine the carnivore diet with <laughs> game changers and a high fiber diet all from you know plant-based options. And then you can go have way more than your two beers per night, Chad, and it should, should make there things better. The thought process is that, um, to make a really long story short, is it kind of like this, this high protein, high fiber diet delays what we call gastric emptying. So food ends up in your stomach and into your small intestine. Um, and the process by which it's digested and then brought into your bloodstream is a little bit slower. And so you miss this massive spike in blood alcohol level and therefore hopefully on the backside miss the hangover that comes as a result of it. So that's re really oversimplification of why you feel less shitty the next day with a high fiber, high protein diet. I think you just pissed Chad off because it was so close <laughs> to being a perfect combo of saying meat and beer, I'm going to be good. And you threw in this fiber nonsense and now he has oh, to have a salad and like, God, I can't well, do you that. Know, you know, Chad, so close like, to perfection. Chad, raspberries are like the highest fiber fruit out there. So okay. I think you can eat like a bag of raspberries. So if you see Chad at next Power Monkey camp, just like downing raspberries. Sure. Every you know what's following know it. Now. You know what's following it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, oh, you know, Hey, whether I ate raspberries or not, you, you know, what's going to follow it. But, um, this is a very important question for me, Mike, and sure. I'm leaning on you to answer appropriately for you. Is it beer or wine? Oh man. Um, I like a high end beer better than I like a high end wine. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeah, I live go. in, I live in, you know, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont border. And we are literally surrounded by like 10 of the best beer, you know, microbreweries in the entire world. And um, it's just so easy to get and it's so cheap and people drive from thousands of miles around and they say, oh, Henny Topper, it's so amazing. And I'm like, yeah, we can have that tomorrow for breakfast if you want, like it's easy. Um, <laughs> and so I, I respect I respect good wine, um, but just from a life uh, ease point of view and what I've experienced more, it is beer. <clears throat> well, I, I, I thank you, I appreciate that. You know, I do because I lose <laughs> To Dave Durante so often that I'll take uh, any little win I can get. And honestly, I don't even know why I hang out with Dave or like him. He doesn't eat red meat. He doesn't like beer. Like Not that I, I don't do. like so beer. I, I mean, I can't even say that living in Portland now, which is like crazy <laughs> beer city over right. there. But, you know, they do have their fair share of wine, which is more my preference oh, when it comes for to sure. drinking. That's for sure. Don't get me wrong. Wine's delicious. And if somebody's going to pour me a glass, I'm almost never going to say no. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, if I, if I had to choose, if you put a gun to my head, I'm going to go with a high, a nice beer. Fine. Awesome. Fine. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mike, I will. I will certainly. Mike, anything in the, in the research area right now that, I mean, you, with your background being more from the, the research and the medical side, when it comes to your nutritionist, anything that you're sure. seeing right now on the research side that's getting you, getting you really excited or something you're kind of wanting other people to know in terms of what's going on right now? Yeah. I mean, the, the field in general is actually making this like massive change where we're starting to understand um, not what we think is good for us from a health and performance point of view, but what we know is good from a health and performance point of view. You know, nutrition has been studied for so long um, and it's been such a just a terrible, terrible field of poorly designed studies that the media over interprets. Um, but people like uh, Alan Aragon. Um, Brad Schoenfield and a bunch of others are starting to actually put out some really great research to say, you know, how big should your calorie deficit be if you want to lose weight? And so this is one area that I kind of wanted to touch upon. So there was this really recent study, maybe about 12 months ago, called uh, the Matador study. It has nothing to do with bullfighting. Sorry, Chad. I didn't mean to get you all excited. Um, <laughs> I, but what uh, they yeah, did, is, I was ready. I know. So they took these two groups and they used obese men because that's a really easy population to work with. And there's a lot of them around. And they put one group on traditional diet. So just constant caloric restriction of about 33%. And let's be clear, 33% is miserable. So if you have a 2000 calorie diet, you're now eating roughly 
1,333 calories instead. So painful. And so they used that group as sort of their control. And they took a second group of people and they said, we're going to put these guys on an intermittent energy restriction diet. So nothing to do with intermittent fasting. What they did is they did two weeks of calorie restriction, two weeks of calorie maintenance. So we'll say a 2000 calorie diet person. So they did two weeks of 1,333, two weeks of 2000. And then they started to adjust for these people as they lost weight over time. And what they showed was that the people that went through this, you know, intermittent energy restriction state um, had ended up with better long-term uh, weight loss, less adaptive thermogenesis, meaning their metabolisms were in a better state um, than the group that went through traditional dieting. And so this is using like pure science to figure out a better approach to dieting. And it actually means that you get to take a break. So compliance is better at the end of the day as well. So this was a huge win for the nutritional field. Um, a lot more studies need to be done. Is two weeks and two weeks what you need to do? Is a 33% deficit the right approach or not? But it's a, it's a huge step forward to show you don't just need to be in a diet 24-7, 365 to make progress. And so that study to me was like game changing. Uh, we immediately made changes within our company about how we approached, you know, um, weight loss clients and things like that. And we've seen nothing but success with it since then. Well, for first, first off there, 33% seems pretty significant of a, of yeah. a drop off. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's huge. For sure. I don't know if I can so they, like that. the people that were in this study, um, people that were in this study were like basically being monitored and had access to a, like a nutritionist like every day of the week. And that's pretty much the only way you're going to live in a 33% calorie deficit short of having you know, amazing willpower. So we adapted that approach. We, we've we changed a few parameters, 20% um, calorie deficits. We changed the length of the cut and the maintenance period a little bit to be a little bit more in the favor of what we think is appropriate. Um, and we're still seeing results. But yeah, the first thing we did was get away from 33%. <laughs> and, and the other thing you mentioned in there is, uh, you know, specific diets. And I'm not a fan of the word diet. I, I don't think that no. that's conducive to longevity. Uh, anything no. that you're trying to get someone to do from my, my perspective should be a lifestyle change. And I'm, I'm assuming right. that you're in that same boat. And when it comes to oh, these 100%. things, right? I mean, it's gotta be something like, do you, do you envision someone cutting back 33% as being sustainable for them? Do you think that that's something five years from now they're going to be able to do? It's most likely something that they can kind of say, okay, I can actually incorporate this into a lifestyle five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. A hundred percent. So, you know, diet. People, people associate the word diet and say diet means like calorie restriction, right? That's what most people think of if I say, what does the word diet mean? And diet actually comes from the Greek word, which I think means like a new lifestyle or something like that, which I think is exactly what you're getting at. So, you know, fun fact, basically every contestant that's gone to the biggest loser and lost, you know, 70, 100 pounds has gained all of it back. Like basically all of them. Why? They're not learning lifestyle changes. And so if you want to make long, you know, if you want to see changes in your body composition, your health, your performance, you know, extreme approaches just don't work using some, in my opinion, some, you know, this is going to be a little bit contentious using some app that tells you exactly how much to eat for every single meal of the day and doesn't let you go out to restaurants and make good decisions that are still in line with your diet, even though you have no idea how many calories are in it doesn't work. And so you have to kind of look at like the big picture and say, what am I willing to change to achieve my goal? You know, if your sleep is a disaster, the chances of you sticking with your diet are basically slim to none. You know, I just went through a phase with, you know, we've got a seven month old baby now. Like we didn't get very much sleep at all. I can tell you, I didn't give a, like a rat's ass what, what I was eating for about three months of that. It was about survival, you know? And so if you're not willing to put effort into changing your sleep pattern, changing your stresses, you know, um, exercising in some form or another, even though it may not be great for weight loss, but ultimately just aligning your actions with your goals, then the chances of you realizing long-term progress are basically slim to none. You know, I like to say extreme approaches never work. It's sort of actually, Dave, you know, when I talk about this at Power Monkey, um, I use your, your handstand as a progression, like as an example, right? Like, could you just simply put somebody in a handstand and have them do a push-up, Like if they had some decent skill and get it done relatively quickly, the answer is undoubtedly yes. But ultimately, they're probably going to hurt themselves, and they're not going to make the progress that they want to make with their skill development. It's the exact same thing with nutrition. You know, I could probably just toss people into extreme calorie deficits. We would see about 50% of them lose weight. The other 50% would bail on the whole thing from to begin with. You know, 
would they make long-term progress? No, at some point they're either gonna get too hungry and they're gonna stop or their body's gonna adapt and they're gonna hit a plateau. And then the question is, well, what do I do now, right? And I think this is the approach that many companies out there, not, not within the CrossFit space, but just globally, they do. They put people into such extreme approaches that they generate you know, three month progress photos that look amazing, that they can put on their social media page that result in another you know, 500 people signing up for their program. And three months later, those people are back to the weight that they were or worse, heavier, right? But who cares because we've got new clients coming to the door and money looks great right now. And so, you know, I see that business model. I have no interest in it. I have no, I have no interest in it. Everything that we do is about long-term progress, real lifestyle changes, because those are the only things that are going to work long-term. I want to teach you how to, you know, how to make your nutrition choices for the rest of your life, just in the same way that, you know, Chad wants to teach somebody to squat for the rest of their life, or you want to teach somebody, you know, how to do handstands for the rest of their life. Like there's a right way to do it. And then there's the easy way to do it. And they're not the same thing. Yeah, kind of building on that, Mike, I want to go back to something you said earlier about the, the, the study where they went for two weeks at that 30, 33% deficit, and then they went back to uh, their mm -hmm. normal. So kind of the way that you put it is they have a break in there. That was very mm -hmm. interesting to me, and it reminded me of instances where I've worked with athletes for a long period of time, and we're in there in the gym on a regular basis, and we're hammering our way, and, and things are going good. We're we're uh, improving technique, we're improving strength, and we're getting better. Mm -hmm. And then a competition comes around, and then they're out of the gym for one week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks, maybe even longer for some of them, some of them that are uh, that have something in their life going on. But it's always been interesting to me after those, um, you know, that one week or or however long it was, when they come back, not only did they not forget how to move, they actually from the very first day after that break are magically and kind of to my eye moving better right so it's definitely interesting how um how the mind and the body works and it kind of sounds to me like it's similar to and tell me if i'm I'm wrong here it sounds very similar to um the way that we train our body to get stronger is ideally mm -hmm. you push for a certain amount of time in weightlifting we like to go two weeks maybe three mm -hmm. and then we back off a little bit for one week uh for example so right. i've always used kind of a um, a push, push, uh, or a heavy, heavy, light, heavy, heavy, yep. light, uh, principle in, in regards to week is, is that a good comparison to make? It is a good comparison to make, you know, um, in your case, you're looking for, you know, compensation effects and things like that. In this case, what we're trying to avoid is something called adaptive thermogenesis. So basically, uh, to make a, a complicated term, relatively simple, we know that your metabolism is going to slow down as you, as you lose weight, you, there's simply less of you. Um, so your met metabolic rate is lower, you're eating less foods or your thermic effect of food is lower. Um, and then there's some adaptations that occur that, you know, we don't expect. And so let's say Dave's doing a diet and his metabolism is now 1800 calories when we expected it to be 2000 calories. That difference we call adaptive thermogenesis. And so when you take these, you know, diet breaks or these periods out of caloric restriction, What's happening is you're restoring your metabolic health and you're preventing adaptive thermogenesis. It's just like, I think, weightlifting where, you know, you're allowing for compensation effects to occur. Maybe you're also allowing for, you know, um, decreased neurological, you know, um, restrictions from building up and things that are protecting the body from a from a different point of view. But ultimately, the, the principle seems very similar. Yeah, I definitely just had a light bulb moment there, Mike. I never looked at nutrition in that way at all. And it makes, it makes so much sense. And I think I'll be able to kind of use that for myself and maybe recommend to some other, some other athletes moving forward better yet. I'll probably just send them your way if I, <laughs> if I really, really need to, but you for know, sure. we we've covered, we've covered a lot uh, already, Mike. And, and I think the listeners already are going to get so much uh, out of this, but I always want to make sure that we kind of recap, so to speak and, sure. and summarize. Can you, can you just, even if it's some of the same stuff that we went over, can you, kind of summarize and, and go over maybe your uh, three top quick tips for helping people improve their nutrition? Yeah. So um, top three tips for improving nutrition. One has nothing to do with nutrition directly. It's sleep. Um, there's, I honestly believe there's nothing that you can do more importantly in your life, regardless of whether or not you're trying to improve your nutrition, your overhead squat, your gymnastics, your you know five mile time, your happiness, your ability to be a mom, et cetera, than sleep. Um, it's probably the most important thing that you can do. Seven hours minimum a night is everyone's goal. 
And I know that's hard for some people, but just make it an attitude in your life that you're going to make sleep the biggest priority besides, you know, what you need to do to survive. And you'll be better at everything else in your life. Uh, two would be to focus on um, long-term progressions. Don't buy into programs that promise immediate results that say in even eight weeks, you're going to be a totally different person or anything like that. Extremes almost never work. You've got to operate with things that you can do for more than two to three months. Otherwise, you're just going to end up back where you are today. Um, and then number three would be to, to create a good social network around yourself that's supportive. It's really, really, really hard to make these changes. It's damn near impossible to do it if people are giving you shit about it and tearing you down along the way. Find people that are supportive of you in your goals and everything's going to be uh, a thousand times easier to achieve. So those are probably be the top three. All right, so one of the things that's happened recently, Mike, that um, I know you're pretty excited about is uh, the new baby in your life. You had a new daughter. Yeah, you said you mentioned it earlier seven months ago, and I'm just kind, yeah. of, kind of curious how that's been going. How's it being a dad? Uh, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life, for sure, but also the most rewarding, for sure, as well. Um, nothing, literally nothing can prepare you for that change, to say the least, Um we tried really, really hard and we're still just completely overwhelmed by the, by the experience. Um, and every day is like, uh, trying to do a puzzle where somebody keeps changing the puzzle pieces on you. <laughs> and, uh, that's the best analogy I can probably use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love yeah. that. That's actually a really good way to put it. Uh, you mentioned the importance of sleep, you know, in the last little segment there, <laughs> Chad was asking you the top priority in life in terms of well being, <laughs> nutrition, being healthier, <laughs> sleep. Yep. Throw a baby into the mix. Everything goes out the window with sleep. How's your sleep patterns oh, been lately oh my over the past seven months? Uh, they were brutal for quite a while. Um, fun little fact about our daughter is that for whatever reason, she hates bottles and drinking milk from them unless she's sound asleep. And so um, hmm. she essentially would only only eat while taking naps, essentially, or at nighttime. And so that's really hard to do, of course, when she's at daycare. And so a lot of the feeding that we had to do ended up taking place when she would come home at roughly five o'clock until she was satisfied. Um, and so we had a lot of long nights there for a while. But thankfully, at this point, she's eating real foods and she's gotten a little bit better about the bottle. And so we've actually had about like two weeks, knock on wood, um, of solid sleep here. And we're, we're trending in the right direction is the best way I can say it change your life again right when you when you start to get those oh. chunks of sleep back again you're like oh my god i never knew what i had before this <laughs> you no, start you're, to you're like, get your life back again right. it's like, amazing so much more energy in the last two weeks than i've had for the past six months it's amazing yeah yeah so mike i always enjoy hearing uh kind of people's backgrounds and you know, major life events or circumstances um, or tragedies that people have gone through that mm -hmm. uh, lead them to overcome uh, and really lead them to be the be the person that they are. And so, uh, you you were adopted, and, mm -hmm. and being adopted, I'm curious to know what it's what it's like uh, to come out of that situation and be a parent and have that type of uh, relationship with another human being. Oh, completely. Um... So, yeah, so I was adopted when I was a baby. So I was in a foster home for about two months before, you know, being with my my parents. And, you know, I consider my adoptive parents, my parents' parents. Um, and so, you know, that definitely shaped my experience. Like you guys were talking about earlier about never wanting to be wrong. Well, when I was a kid, you know, I never wanted to be the bad kid because I, you know, I think subconsciously was constantly thinking, well, hey, they could, you know, they could give me up again. And of course, that was that was never, ever going to happen. But, you know, subconsciously, I think it has a, a huge impact on, on things. And so now sort of having, you know, um, a daughter of our own, you know, I think it's probably sort of impacted like the, it's impacted me from the point of view of sort of, you know, understanding to an extent, um, like it's freaking hard raising a kid. And so, you know, to, to expect that or to, um, to have the foresight to know that you're not like mentally, emotionally, and physically ready to make that happen and put the, you know, the health and the, um, the betterment of that child above your own health and benefit is a huge, huge thing to do and really, 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 really hard. Um, and so it 
it gave me perspective to some extent on like, you know, um, what that person must have been thinking about in that moment, as opposed to all the things that I had imagined for, you know, many, 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 mm -hmm. many, many years, um, what they, what the reasons were, which are all negative. Now it just comes down mm -hmm. to a different thing entirely. And it's all about love, you know, no surprise there. Yeah, that, it, absolutely. And that could be a whole other podcast in itself. I oh, think Mike to dig into that uh, a little bit more, but uh, one of the things for you is uh, that you try to impress on people is you don't need to look a certain way mm -hmm. to deserve love and happiness. And, and that's kind of become a theme of your, of your coaching. I know. So do you think that your experience being adopted and going through those, those thoughts through your life and overcoming that um, has, has led to that? I wouldn't say necessarily the adoption per se directly, but it's sort of indirectly for sure. You know um, I think to an extent thinking about, self-acceptance and finding intrinsic value um, is something that was a journey for me, right? You know, it wasn't about um, being right or wrong. It wasn't about being able to be the smart person in the room. Um, it was just about being myself and, you know, being, you know, a quote, good person um, and being somebody that made other people feel good about themselves. And that's an intrinsic characteristic that all of us have, you know? And so, you know, when somebody comes to us as a nutrition company, like, it's usually because something in their life isn't going the way that they want it to. And maybe that's, um, maybe that's a, an aesthetics thing. They don't feel like they look the way that they need to for people to accept them. Maybe, you know, um, it's a performance thing. They have to be, you know, uh, a national level weightlifter or, you know, a sanctional level CrossFit games athlete before they're going to get the respect that they deserve. And typically when they find those things, they actually don't end up being happy or those, those happiness moments are fleeting. You know, um, I can't tell you the number of times I've gotten people to an aesthetic goal that they want and they get there and they're like, man, this wasn't, this, <laughs> this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to be happy when I got here. And it turns out that it wasn't, it wasn't about abs. It wasn't about, you know, uh, a six pack or, you know, a defined upper back, or it wasn't about a hundred kilo snatch. It was about something deeper. And so, you know, with the nutrition coaching that we do, we try to we try to dive deeper into those topics and really figure out like what's, you know, what's somebody's motivation and what do they need to change for them to find happiness in their life. And oftentimes it means that they get to, you know, spend more time with their friends. Um, they get to find more balance in, in their nutrition. Um, they get to have, you know, um, they have to have some really hard conversations. But at the end of the day, it allows for significant progress towards happiness. And that's really what we're trying to do, even though it's all disguised under nutrition coaching. I mean, I, I find that to be, yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, it's one of the reasons why I love having you on board with us, Mike. I mean, you being part of our Power Monkey team and, and being the, the resource that we look to from a nutritional standpoint, it just fits in so well with the way that we look at coaching, you know, our sports as well. And it's looking, it's taking a holistic view at the person, not just trying to get them that hundred kilo snatch or that, you know, that handstand push up, whatever it might be, but saying, okay, right. what do we need to look at here to make you a better person all the way around? And maybe that approach will allow you to get those other things a little bit more easily. And I think, I, totally. I think you fitting in from that perspective, just, it's one of the reasons why you being part of our team just makes sense. No, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yep. Uh, so for any of the listeners out there, Mike, that, that kind of have enjoyed your approach here and want to get started, can you, can you point them in the right direction uh, just in regards to getting started with their nutrition or even getting in touch with uh, M2 Nutrition if, if that's what they want to do? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so I do own uh, M2 Performance Nutrition. Um, and that's probably the best way to kind of find out more about me and what we do. So we have a website, we have an Instagram page, uh, we have an extensive blog with, um, a lot of posts that kind of dive into topics like we were just talking about. Um, those are the places that I would, I would say, go read those posts, um, go find out who we are. Um, and if that, if that approach resonates with you, then reach out, um, through the website, um, or you can contact me directly through uh, my Instagram handle, which has been down here on the lower left uh, side of my my video box the whole time um i will definitely respond to you i will you know reach out um and we'll figure out what the right approach to kind of get you headed on your path towards happiness is whether that's nutrition or some other aspect of your life that we can help you know put in alignment with your goals we're we're there to do it for you 
Fantastic, Mike. All right, we're coming towards the last couple of questions here. <laughs> this one is very important to both Chad and I, and we have a running tally as to this question. And oh boy, before you answer, I'm, I'm, I'm one up today already. Yeah, <laughs> don't you way. can't throw in your own your own separate questions and expect those to count for anything. But just remember, Mike, before you answer, who is the one that's as big of a Top Gun fan as you are, and that's me. All right. So just before okay. you answer all the right. question, all right. <laughs> what sport or discipline is better, gymnastics or weightlifting? Ooh, better? Oh, man. Damn. Chad, you're going to kill me. I got to go with gymnastics. <laughs> what, what do you say? Oh, it's, it's, is, is, that, is that because of your rock climbing background? I think what? it's only because of the rock climbing thing, Chad. I am so sorry. But, man, um, yeah, the big, thick legs don't don't go up a wall real easy. But the, the upper body, you know, uh, strength helps in a big way. So, you know, uh, I'm going to whisper really, really softly gymnastics over here. <laughs> That's well, right. I mean, thank you. you know, I, I can, I can respect that. I mean, I hate to lose, but I, I'm going to go back and take my win of you liking beer today. That's what I'm going to, I think that's he what knew. I'm going to dwell on. I think you knew I that mean, Mike was going to say gymnastics there. So you threw in another question early just to get an early win. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, the, the thing is, I can't even get Mike Service to say weightlifting. He <laughs> gave us a, a, a diplomatic answer, answer yeah. and said, "I mean, and, and said that you, they were a tie." You have to ask the weight of the question, right? Like, so what's like the weight? You know, on a scale from one to ten, how important to your listeners is the question: beer versus wine versus weightlifting versus gymnastics? <laughs> and I feel like it's skewed heavily in the beer wine question. So, <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. So, um, Mike, we also like to finish up with a with a little game, and and we have a few different ones that we play. But the one we're going to go with today, if you're okay with uh, 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 entertaining us here, is uh, rapid fire questions, and we'll do three quick questions. And your job is just to kind of answer without thinking a whole lot, and and let's see what comes out. All right, I'll give it. I'll give it my best effort. <laughs> All right, let's see it. So, what we have here is who is your favorite superhero, and why? Uh, Superman. He can do basically everything. Superman. Okay. Okay. You might have some some challengers uh, to that. I think you know Batman versus Superman kind of thing, right? Um, all right. Here's an interesting one that we haven't asked anyone yet. If you could be any flavor of ice cream, what ice ice cream flavor would it be, and why? Any flavor of ice cream. Um, I like black raspberry. It's sweet and a little sour at the same time. Black raspberries, yeah. is that what you said? Black raspberry, sweet and a little sour at the same time. I've never tried that one. I'll, I'll have to give it a try. Didn't you say something about raspberries earlier? <laughs> yeah, about uh, really high in fiber. fiber. There you yeah. go. Good for, okay. good for your... Maybe I, <laughs> maybe I can eat black raspberry ice cream and then go drink beer. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do at you know, camp every day. Chad, Chad, you and I will run an experiment at camp in May, and we'll see how it goes. Sound good? <laughs> I'm up for it. Hey, I was going to ask you anyway, how in the world do I get into one of those experiments of the, the oh, man. science of boozing? I, I'd love to do that. <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that for free all, uh, all day long. You know um, it, man. All right. Last one here. Who is your favorite cartoon character and why? Oh, favorite cartoon character. Um, rapid Fire. I am a big fan of Family Guy and Brian from Family Guy. I think he's hysterical. So uh, he's a dog and just always loved him. A plus on that answer. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great one. That's a good one for sure. Um, Dave, do you have any, any last minute words for Mike here before we shut it down? Not at all. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for coming on. And I think we'll have to do a uh, part two once uh, Maverick comes out. And we'll, uh, we'll recap yeah, that and do just a little <laughs> uh, secondary podcast I, review and whole thing. I can't think of anything better than talking an hour about Top Gun. So let's make that we'll happen. Do, we'll do a shirtless with volleyballs as well, just to make sure it's very authentic. All right. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not, I'm not going to be on that one because I don't want to stand <laughs> next to you guys uh, shirtless. Uh, both of you guys are a little bit too jacked for me, unless, unless they can look at my quads. Uh, maybe we just have a, a picture of my, my quads on there. But um yeah, Mike, it's, it's certainly been a pl pleasure chatting with you. I know the listeners are going to get a whole lot out of that. And you guys listening back home, be sure to head over to PowerMonkeyFitness.com for uh, services and upcoming events. Uh, check out our Instagram pages as well for regular teaching and technical content at PowerMonkeyFitness, also at Dave Durante and at Ollie Chad. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys as well. You can always leave us a rating or review wherever you're getting your podcast. Um, 
Also, let us know if there's any content you want us to cover, questions you have. You you can request those uh, by sending us an email to podcast at powermonkeyfitness.com. On behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Vaughn with Dave Durani. And until next time, thank you all for listening. (laughs) 